and welcome back mindsetters hope you had a nice little break you went to do whatever you had to do you went to put your bags down you went to change your uniform whatever you had to do now you need to be paying attention put everything else away have your pens and pads out and ready to make notes by the way we actually got a question in Cheryl if you don't mind me asking pleasure wanted to find out how many biomes do we have in our country Okay, pleasure. Sometimes, there's, as I said earlier, there's a bit of a, um, some say they combine some of them together, but if you work on, it's easier to work on the eight major biomes. I'm going to, I'll quickly show you what they are. If you look at the map, all right, we have done savanna, we have done grassland, so that is two. Number three is going to be our Namakuru. We have done that, that is number three. What we're going to be doing now all right, is the fane boss, that is number four. What we're going to find up along Durban over here, we're going to find thickets, all right, that could be number five. You'll see a small area over here, that is going to be um, the forests, that's going to be number six. We're going to have a look at succulent karoo, number seven, all right, and you will find... We do say deserts, that's number eight, but one of the, one of the ones that we also have are wetlands. Now, when, when we look at wetlands, like we're going to see them just now, you will see they, sp they, they spread out throughout the country. So it's not, just, um, it's not kept to just one particular area as the others usually are. So that becomes what we call an aquatic biome rather than the, all right, the eight major terrestrial ones. Pleasure, I hope that answers your question. All right, let's carry on with looking at our biomes. If you were to look at all the biomes, I think this, all right, is South Africa's most, pri the pride and glory of South Africa is our Feinbos area. Because this area, if you have a look where it is, right, it's in the Western Cape leading up to the Eastern Cape. And, the, and the, if we have a look over here, all right, let me just get there. If we have a look over here, let me just get the pencil going. I'm going to use another color. If we look at this region over here, all right, as most of us, we could say that's the Cape, the Cape Town, that's going to be your area of your fane boss, all right? So you're going to have mountain ranges over here, and I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with Table Mountain. So the fane boss area, this area, fane boss means little leaves, all right? This area has got the most endemic plant species that can be found in South Africa. It actually, all over the world, they have taken floral kingdoms, where six kingdoms, which are um, six areas that have got the most biodiversity, and the South African, um, the Cape Floral Kingdom is, is South Africa's pride and glory there. If we have a look, all right, at the, our areas that we're going to see, okay, it's going to be what we the Cape weathers. Now, the Cape Town weathers, all right, the weather that we often see in Cape Town, can be, you, c you know, it's lots of, lots of rain, all right, during the winter months, but the winter months also can be very, very windy and can be very, very cold, right? The current that's coming through there is still the cold Benguela, but at the bottom where it meets the, the warm Agullis, there is going to be some rain. Okay, so what we're going to have a look over here, when we have a look at the, the fane boss, all right, this is the one that you guys are going to come to mind immediately. That's where one of the, the, um, the characteristics is going to be the protea, all right, which, as I said, where's the springbok is our national emblem for the buck. The, our king protea is our national flower emblem. All right, so if we have a look at our fane boss, Right, you're going to see some of the area over there. This, uh, those of you who can recognize it, sorry, let me go back again. All right, that is rooibos tea. Okay, rooibos, the area in which rooibos is grown is totally what they call a bioclimate. All right, it's such, the area in which it's grown has got such particular climatic conditions that that's the only place that it can be grown. And you know that rooibos, other than teas, right, is also wonderful, all right, for skin care and all of those things. Lots of the plants that are found in the fainbos, okay, are very much, if you have a look at buku, right, all of that 
helps in medicines. The Fainbos has such a great biodiversity, lots of it is helped in, in the medicine sector. Now if we, we have a look here, what's very important about the Fainbos is that, as I said to you, most of the species are endemic. That means we don't find them anywhere else in the world, just here in this particular region. But if we go back to our map, all right, those of you who are from the, the Cape, what you will also notice along there, what do we like to call this area? The wine route. Okay, the wine route. So this area over here is very, it's highly industrialized. So wine farms, right, all along this area are taking over from land that should be used for, all right, for natural vegetation. Also, when we come here, we also find that the introduction of alien species into this area is also having an effect on the survival of these species. All right, some indigenous plants don't have any um, some um, non-indigenous plants, sorry, don't have any effect on the environment. Um, we're not going to bring them. They're not going to, we don't need to kill them immediately, right? Rather, let them die out so we not replace. The black wattle is one of those that generally needs to be cut down immediately because it absorbs and keeps so much water. And we find that that is also, right, decreasing our biodiversity. Now, the funny thing about Fainbos, all right, is it needs fire. It needs to have fire in order for the seeds to actually to burst open and to germinate, right? The heat from the fire actually stimulates a chemical inside the seed, right? And that actually helps with germination. So where sometimes where fires are not very helpful, when it comes to the Feinbos, right, it is a very helpful way of germinating. If I were to look at the animals again, all right, notice here this is a very, um, the shell of the tortoise, you'll see there, it's called the geometric tortoise. You'll notice it has a very, all right, particular shape on its shell, which makes it quite noteworthy. As I've said, there's the rooibos. For those of you who love olives, okay, in your salad or your olive oil, all right, also a good region there. The one animal that is, there's not a lot of large animals there. Right, most of them are small little riverine rabbits, there's dussies and those kind of things. What you're going to find there, all right, is leopards. Leopards are, all right, one of the, the main species that are going to be found there. Me leopards tend to be solitary creatures that like mountainous areas, all right, which is perfect, all right, for that region over there. Okay, let's carry on to, you'll see over here, this is a little clip springer key, all right, small little small little buck, all right, and obviously with the mountainous regions there in the Western Cape that we do have the mountains, the clip spinning, which means literally rock jumper, all right, it's going to be adapted nicely, small, right, for that area, and very mobile among the rocks. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Okay, this is now, as I say to you, the succulent karoo. Now, the succulent karoo is still is very similar, okay, to, all right, to the, um, over here, if we have a look, sorry, it's very, um, it's very similar to the, to the, na the nama karoo. Now, for those of you who, I'm going to just do it over here, sorry, let's go this area, you can see it's highlighted, all right, this is far, much nearer to the coast, right, than the Namakuru is. So what you tend to find there is that there's a lot of fog, all right? Although there might not be a lot of rain, there's lots of fog. And what the fog does is when there are trees there, it actually makes lichen. Remember lichen grows on trees. It's that, that greeny white kind of mold, all right? I think I've got a picture here. I'll show it for you just now. And that actually adds as a food source, all right, for lots of the, the little the, um, insects and the birds, etc., that are living in that area. When we look at the Nama, at the, sorry, the succulent karoo, all right, there we go. Most of you, all right, when we think of it, our big tourist attraction there is going to be our Namaquiland daisies. 
What you will find usually, you will see they have a bit of a winter rainfall, all right? They have a bit of a winter rainfall, not too much rain. It's very dry. And that winter rainfall brings about the most awesome, beautiful carpet of daisies that brings a lot of tourists, all right, into, into the into that area, all right, the Western Cape route. And remember, they're only going to, all right, flower for a couple of weeks, and then they're going to die, and it's going to be all dry again. Other plants that are there, all right, are going to be your fahis. If we look at the animals that are there, all right, small, not overly large. Again, the area, as I said, remember, is very dry because of that cold Benguela current not bringing too much moisture into the coast. If you'll have a look here, the bat-eared fox. All right, I'm sure all of you can see the meerkats. We're going to have our little reptiles, our lizards, and our geckos. Right? And what we're going to find quite often is because it's generally very hot during the day and then much cooler at night, that lots of the animals here are going to be nocturnal. Right? Because it's much cooler at night, they're going to come out and they're going to, their behavior, whether it's to hunt or to find whatever they need to find, they're going to do that at night because it is much cooler. Okay, we're going to go on to the next one. All right. As you will notice over here, I think I definitely am going to need to highlight this one. Okay, it's a very, very, very small one. South Africa's climate, all right, and probably our farming techniques, etc., is not very conducive to large forests, okay? Those of you, if you think about this area over here, I think most of you will be looking at Nisna, the Nisna forests. Those of you who've read um, Dalian Matia's book, you know, um, Philosa Kint and all of those, they are all set here within the, the Nisna forest area over there. So if we have a look at the forest, there are a few, every now there's a few little spatterings of forests up along here, but generally, all right, the amount of rainfall and the soil type does not encourage the growth of really large trees because that's exactly what forests are. They're really, really large trees. When we look at plants, we're at forests, those large trees are what we call climax communities. Remember, you have pioneer communities like moss and fern and grass that start to break up the soil and add the nutrients so that eventually the much larger plants right, can then come and grow there. So when it comes to our forests, large trees, all right, quite humid, and you actually, funny enough, you'll actually find elephants, all right, in that. Now, because of the very fertile soil, you are going to find a large variety of trees. Over here, this is an epiphyte, this is an orchid, all right, that's growing on the trees. Here we can see our um, acacia, little daycare keys, the bird life in the forest, you're going to have a much greater biodiversity all right, of birds. Because of the high amount of rainfall, you can have all the trees together. And I'm not talking about sappies plantation trees. That's not a forest. That's commercial farming. I'm talking about a natural bio all right, that is there naturally, not man-made. You'll have a look here, the bush pig, right? One of my favorite birds, that is the lurie. So you're going to have the trees bring about a whole different right, variety, especially if we look here for the first time, we're going to see birds. We're not going to see birds too often in the desert, right? Because there's very little for them to eat. It's also very cold there, right? And generally, the coldness, they're going to stick to more milder temperatures. Okay, so the forest, large, big trees, lots of uh, um, bird life, and lots of small little animals. As I said, the bush pig, the daikiki, right? But funny enough, believe the elephants as well, okay, also are going to be found within this forest region. So when we look at forests, all right, you're going to see that generally they need to have rain all year round. Most of the biomes that we've looked at, it's seasonal rain. Okay, so for a forest, you are going to have to look at quite a high 
percentage of rain right throughout the year. And obviously, most of the soils, believe it or not, um, in the, the other regions you can understand in the deserts and those kind of in the in the the Nama Karoo and the succulent Karoo is not very fertile because there's not a lot of waste that's dying in there, all right? This soil, very fertile, very fertile, all right, can nice big trees can grow. Okay, Ty? Mm, I think after this we can go for a little ad break. I mm. think so. All, all right. right. So mindsetters, you know the drill. Make sure you get on the page, chat to me, chat to me, and let me know what you guys are thinking. If you guys are having any problems, any issues, let me know. Post them on the page, and I'll get those credits to Cheryl. But for now, we'll see you after this break. <laughs>